So I'm so grateful to the Native Organization of Indigenous Scholars for inviting me here to this beautiful place that they've created, the community has created, and all these communities around this land this is, especially the Duwamish Nation whose territory was taken to build this city, and one day will be Duwamish territory again. Uh, I want to, um, today I, you know, the indigenous people's history of the United States, um, I, uh, I decided to, to um, bring to you the resistance movement uh, that I was part of in my life and uh, still am. And I call this the ghost dance prophecy. A nation is coming. I think most of you have um, know what the ghost dance is, but if you don't ask about it, we're going to have time for Q&A, I think. <clears throat> Here's a stanza from a ghost dance, a Lakota ghost dance. The whole world is coming. A nation is coming. A nation is coming. The eagle has brought the message to the tribe. And then Wallace Black Elk, in 1973, during the Wounded Knee siege, said, Little Wounded Knee is turned into a giant world. So this is the era of the so-called New Frontier that was kicked off uh, in, um, in 1960. Seventy years after the 80, 1890 Wounded Knee Massacre at, at uh, Pine Ridge, when the conquest of the continent was said to have been complete, and with Hawaii and Alaska made into states illegally, rounding out the 50 stars on today's United States flag, the myth of an exceptional United States people destined to bring order out of chaos, to stimulate economic growth, and to replace savagery with civilization not just in North America, but throughout the world. This proved to have enormous staying power. A key to John F. Kennedy's political success was that he revived the frontier as a trope of popular imperialism, openly based on the drama and popular myth of settling the continent, or, quote, taming the wilderness. In Kennedy's accepted speech at the 1960 Democratic National Convention in Los Angeles, the presidential nominee asked his audience to see him as a new kind of frontiersman, confronting a different sort of wilderness. Kennedy said, I stand tonight facing west on what was the last frontier. From the lands that stretched 3,000 miles behind me, the pioneers of old gave up their safety, their comfort, and sometimes their lives to build a new world here on the continent. We stand today on the edge of a new frontier, a frontier of unknown opportunities and paths, a frontier of unfulfilled hopes and threats. Kennedy's use of the new frontier to encapsulate his campaign echoed debates about U.S. history that had begun more than six decades earlier. In 1894, historian Frederick Jackson Turner had presented his history-making frontier thesis, so-called, claiming that the crisis of that era was the result of the closing of the frontier and that a new frontier was needed to fill the ideological and spiritual vacuum created by the completion of settler colonialism. The Turner thesis, so-called, served as a dominant school of history of the U.S. West through most of the 20th century. The frontier metaphor described Kennedy's plan for employing political power to make the world the new frontier of the United States. Central to this vision was the Cold War 
uh, what writer Richard Slotkin calls a heroic engagement in the long twilight struggle against communism to which the nation was summoned, as Kennedy characterized it in his inaugural address. Soon after he took office, that struggle took the form of a counterinsurgency program in Vietnam. Seven years after Kennedy's nomination, American troops would be describing Vietnam as Indian country and search and destroy missions as a game of cowboys and Indians. And the Kennedy ambassador to Vietnam would justify a massive military escalation by citing the necessity of, quote, <clears throat> moving the Indians away from the fort so that the settlers could plant corn. The movement of indigenous peoples to undo what generations of frontier expansionists had wrought continued during the Vietnam era and won some major victories, but more importantly, a shift in indigenous consensus, will, and vision towards self-determination and land restitution, which prevails today. Activists' efforts to end termination and secure restoration of land, particularly sacred sites, included Taos Pueblo's 64-year struggle with the U.S. government to reclaim their sacred Blue Lake in the Sangre de Cristo Mountains of New Mexico. In the first land restitution to any indigenous nation, President Richard M. Nixon signed into effect Public Law 91 550 on December 15, 1970, which had been approved by bipartisan majorities in Congress. Nixon stated, this is a bill that represents justice because in 1906 an injustice was done in which land involved in this bill, 48,000 acres, was taken from Taos Pueblo Indians. The Congress of the United States now returns that land to whom it belongs. The hearings held, this is, uh, you know, right at the height, this is actually um, Alcatraz was still under occupation at the time. In hearings held in the preceding years by the Senate Subcommittee on Indian Affairs, members expressed fear of establishing a precedent in awarding land based on ancient uses, treaty, treaties and aboriginal ownership rather than monetary payment. <clears throat> As one witness te testifying in opposition to the return of Taos land said, the history of the land squabbles in New Mexico and the whole West among various groups of Indians uh, is well known. Substantially, every acre of our public domain, be it national forests, state parks, or wilderness areas, is threatened by claims from the Indians who say they have ancestral rights to the land to the exclusion of all other persons, which can only be fostered and encouraged by this present legislation if passed. Although the Senate subcommittee members finally agreed to the Taos claim by satisfying themselves that it was unique, it did in fact set a precedent. <coughs> The return of Blue Lake as a sacred site begs the question of whether other indigenous sacred sites remaining as national or state parks, or as U.S. Forest Service or Bureau of Land Management lands and waterways should be also returned. Administration of the Grand Canyon National Park has been partially restored to its ancestral caretakers, the Havasupai Nation, but other federal lands have not. A few sites, such as the volcanic El Malpai, a sacred site for Pueblo Indians in New Mexico, its lava beds, have been designated as national monuments by executive order rather than restored as indigenous territory. The most prominent struggle has been the Lakota Sioux's attempt to restore the Pajasapa, or Black Hills, where the odious Mount Rushmore carvings have scarred the sacred site. Call the shrine of democracy by the federal government is anything but that. Rather, it is a shrine of in-your-face illegal occupation and colonialism. So the return of Taos Blue Lake 
And the 1980 uh, Supreme Court decision that said, indeed, the, the Black Hills were taken illegally, but only offered monetary payment, uh, which the, the Sioux people are, are, are refusing to take. They intend to and will get the Black Hills back. But the, none of this came from on high. In, in addition to the six decade struggle of Taos Pueblo, the restitution took place in the midst of a renewed, powerful, and growing Native American struggle for self-determination. The movement's energy was evident when 26 young Native activists and students founded the National Indian Youth Council, NIYC, in 1961, based in Albuquerque, New Mexico. They were from 21 different Native nations, some from reservations or small towns, and others from relocated families far from home. The founders included Glory Emerson and Herb Blatchford, both from the Dene Nation, Navajo Nation, Clyde Warrior, Ponca from Oklahoma, Mel Tom, Paiute from Nevada, and Shirley Hill Witt, uh, Mohawk. Uh, Cherokee anthropologist Robert K. Thomas mentored the militant young activists. Although primarily committed to, social, to local struggles, their vision was international. As Shirley Hill Witt put it, at a time when new nations all over the globe are emerging from colonial control, their right to choose their own course places a vast burden of responsibility upon the most powerful nation, the United States, to honor and protect indigenous rights. In 1964, NIYC organized support for the ongoing powerful indigenous struggle to protect treaty guaranteed fishing rights in Washington state. Actor Marlon Brando <coughs> took an interest and provided some financial support and publicity by his presence. The so-called fish-in movement soon put the tiny community at Frank's Landing in the headlines. Sid Mills was arrested there on October 13, 1968. Eloquently, he explained his actions. I am a Yakima and a man. For two years and four months, I've been a soldier in the United States Army. I served in combat in Vietnam until critically wounded. I hereby renounce further obligation in service or duty to the United States Army or government. My first obligation now lies with the Indian people fighting for the lawful treaty to fish in usual and accustomed waters of the Nisqually, Columbia, and other rivers of the Pacific Northwest, and in serving them in this fight in any way I can. We will fight for our rights. Hank Adams, with other local leaders, founded the Survival for American Indians Association, which was composed of the Swamamish, Nisqually, Yakima, Paiute, um, Siliguamish, and other indigenous peoples of the Pacific Northwest to carry on the fishing rights struggle. The backlash from Anglo sports fishers was swift and violent. But in 1973, 14 of the fishing nations sued Washington State. And in a reflection of changed times, in the wake of actually during the occupation of Wounded Knee, the following year, US District Court Judge George Bolt found in their favor. He validated their right to 50% of fish taken in the usual and accustomed places that were designated in the 1850s treaties, even where those places were not under contemporary tribal jurisdiction. This was a landmark decision for historical indigenous sovereignty over territories outside federally designated reservation boundaries. The National Indian Youth Council saw itself as an engine for igniting local organizing, marshalling community organizing projects with access to funds from the Johnson administration's War on Poverty, the mandate of which was to implement the principles of the economic and social equality intended by the authors of the Civil Rights Act of 1964. 
Inter-ethnic alliances, including a significant representation of Native peoples, developed during the mid-1960s. These culminated in the 1968 Poor People's Campaign, spearheaded by the Reverend Martin Luther King, Jr., which, considered, which consisted of community organizing and leading marches across the country. In the final months of the campaign planning, Dr. King was assassinated on April 4th, 1968. Thousands of marchers arrived in Washington, D.C. in the next month, and they continued the project. They gathered in a tent city and remained there for six weeks. While local actions multiplied <clears throat> in Native communities and nations, the spectacular November 1969 seizure and 18-month occupation of Alcatraz Island in San Francisco Bay <clears throat> grabbed wide media attention. An alliance known as the Indians of All Tribes was initiated by Native American students and community members in the diaspora, the, the relocation, and also California uh, indigenous peoples. They built a thriving village on the island that drew Native pilgrimages from all over the continent, radicalizing thousands, especially Native youth. Indigenous women leaders were particularly impressive, and this was at the time of the rise of the militant women's liberation movement. Among them, Madonna Thunderhawk, Lenata Means, Warjack, Raina Ramirez, and many others who continued organizing into still organized in the 21st century. <clears throat> so, this, um, at Alcatraz, they made some serious demands um, for five institutions to be established on Alcatraz a Center for Native American Studies, an American Indian Spiritual Center, an Indian Center of Ecology that would do scientific re re research on reversing pollution of water and air, a great Indian training school that would run a restaurant, provide job training, market indigenous arts, and, and teach, quote, the noble and tragic events of Indian history, including uh, the Trail of Tears and the Massacre of Wounded Knee, and a memorial, a reminder that the island had been established as a prison initially to incarcerate and execute California Indian resistors to U.S. assault on their nations. Under orders from the Nixon White House, the indigenous residents remaining on Alcatraz were forced to evacuate on June, uh, in June 1971. Indigenous pro uh, professors Jack Forbes and David Risling, who were in the process of establishing a Native American Studies program at the University of California, Davis, negotiated a grant from the federal government of unused land, federal land near Davis, California, where the institutions demanded by Alcatraz occupants could be established. So a two-year uh, junior college, Native American Chicano College and Movement Center, DQ University, was founded, while UC Davis became the first US university to offer a doctorate in Native American studies. During this period of intense protest and activism, alliances among indigenous governments, including the National Congress of American Indians, NCAI, then led by young Sioux attorney Vine Deloria Jr., turned militant demands into legislation. A year before the seizure of Alcatraz, uh, Anishinaabe activists Dennis Banks and Clyde Bellacourt founded the American Indian Movement which initially patrolled the streets around indigenous housing projects in Minneapolis. Going national, AIM became involved at Alcatraz. With a rather, rather bitter end of the island occupation, as uh, Paul Smith and Robert Boyer write in their book, uh, Like a Hurricane, the future of Indian activism would belong to people far angrier than the student brigades of Alcatraz, 
Urban Indians who managed a life beyond the bottles of cheap wine cruelly named Thunderbird would continue down the protest path. With the Vietnam War still raging and the re-election of Richard Nixon in November 1972 imminent, a coalition of eight indigenous organizations, the American Indian Movement, the National Indian Brotherhood of Canada, later renamed the Assembly of First Nations, the Native American Rights Fund, the, Native, uh, the National Indian Youth Council, the Native, National, uh, National American Indian Council, the National Council on Indian Work, the National Indian Leadership Training, and the American Indian Committee on Alcohol and Drug Abuse organized the Trail of Broken Treaties. Armed with a 20-point position paper that focused on the federal government's responsibility to implement indigenous treaties and sovereignty, Caravan set out in the fall of 1972. The vehicles and numbers of participants multiplied at each stop across the country, converging in Washington, D.C., one week before the presidential election. Hanging a banner from the front of the Bureau of Indian Affairs building that proclaimed it to be the Native American Embassy, hundreds of protesters hailing from 75 indigenous nations entered the building to sit in. This was the civil rights, the days of civil rights sit in, so sit in, finding ways to sit in. Uh, now it's called Occupy, unfortunately. BI personnel at the time, largely non-indigenous, fled and the Capitol Police chain locked the doors, locking them in, announcing that the indigenous protesters were illegally occupying the building. The protesters stayed there for four days, plenty of time for them to read damning federal documents that revealed gross mismanagement of the federal trust responsibility. The Cobell case actually uh, started from these documents. They boxed all of these documents up and took them with them when they left. The Trail of Broken Treaty solidified indigenous alliances and the 20-point position paper, the work mainly of Hank Adams, provided a template for the affinity of hundreds of native organizations. Five years later, in 1977, the document would be presented to the United Nations, forming the basis for the 2007 United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. Three months after the Bureau of Indian Affairs building event, Oglala Lakota traditional people at the Pine Ridge Sioux Reservation in South Dakota invited American Indian, the American Indian Movement uh, which by then Russell Means had uh, become a part of, and he's from Pine Ridge. They invited them to assist them in halting the collusion between their Indian Reorganization Act tribal government and the federal government that had crushed the people, the traditional people, and further impoverished them. The people opposed the increasingly authoritarian reign of the elected tribal chairman. Richard Wilson. They invited the American Indian Movement to send a delegation to support them. On February 27, 1973, long deliberations took place in the Pine Ridge Calico Hall between the local people and AIM leaders led by Russell Means. The AIM activists were well known following the Trail of Broken Treaties caravan and upon AIM's arrival, the FBI, tribal police, and the chairman's armed special unit that called themselves the Guardians of the Oglala Nation, the acronym of which they proudly announced was the Goon Squad. They mobilized. The meeting ended with a consensus decision to caravan to Wounded Knee, in a, to protest the chairman's misdeeds and the violence of his goons. The law enforcement contingent followed and circled the protesters. Over the following days, hundreds of more armed men surrounded Wounded Knee, and so began a two and a half month siege of protesters at the 1890 massacre site. <clears throat> 
The late 20th century hamlet of Wounded Knee was made up of little more than a trading post, a Catholic church, and the mass grave of the hundreds of Lakotas slaughtered in 1890. Now armed personnel carriers, Huey helicopters, and military snipers surrounded the site, while supply teams of mostly Lakota women made their way through the military lines and back out again with supplies through dark of night, every night. So that sort of sets up the, you know, the where we are um, in, in uh, protest. But looking at then the Indian Wars as a template for the United States in the world today. First, the, at that time, the integral link between Wounded Knee of 1890 and Wounded Knee in 1973 suggests a long overdue interpretation of indigenous U.S. relations as a template for U.S. imperialism and counterinsurgency wars that continue today. As Vietnam veteran and author Michael Hare observed, we might as well say that Vietnam was where the Trail of Tears was headed all along, the turnaround point where it would touch and come back to form a containing parameter. Seminole Nation Vietnam War veteran even Haney made the a comparison in testifying at the Winter Soldier investigations of the Vietnam War. Quoting Haney, the same massacres happened to the Indians. I got to know the Vietnamese people and I learned they were just like us. I have grown up with racism all my life. When I was a child watching cowboy and Indians on TV, I would root for the cavalry, not the Indians. That's how bad it was. I was that far toward my own destruction. As it happened, the fifth anniversary of the My Lai massacre in Vietnam occurred at the time of the 1973 siege of Wounded Knee. It was difficult to miss the analogy between the 1890 Wounded Knee massacre and My Lai 1968. Alongside the front page news and photographs of the Wounded Knee siege that was taking place in real time were features with photos of the scene of mutilations and death at my life. Lieutenant William Rusty Calley was then serving his 20-year sentence under house arrest in luxurious office quarters at Fort Benning, Georgia, near his hometown. Yet he remained a national hero who received hundreds of support letters weekly, who was lauded by some as a POW being held by the U.S. military. One of Cali's most ardent defenders was Jimmy Carter, then governor of, California, of uh, Georgia and subsequently president. Three years later as president, um, uh, or three years later, uh, Nixon would pardon Cali. One of the documented acts among many that Cali committed and ordered others to carry out at My Lai took place when he saw a baby crawling from a ditch surrounded by mutilated bloody bodies. He picked the baby up by a leg and threw the infant back into the pit and then shot the baby point blank. My Lai was one of thousands of such slaughters led by officers just like Cali who a few weeks before my life had been observing throwing a stooped old man down a well and firing his automatic rifle down the shaft. The ongoing siege at Wounded Knee in 1973 elicited some rare journalistic probing into the 1890 Army Massacre. In 1970, University Librarian D. Brown had written the book Bury My Heart at Wounded Knee, which documented and told of, um, of, of struggles all over, uh, of Native people against uh, U.S. occupation, uh, including uh, the 1890 Wounded Knee story. The book was a surprise bestseller. <coughs> this was um, in uh, 1970. It just took off and was on the number one bestseller list for a year and then came out in paperback and continued. So a broad public had been um, exposed to uh, this knowledge 
On the front page of one newspaper, editors uh, in 1973, editors placed two photographs side by side, each of a pile of bloody mutilated bodies in a ditch. One was from Mai Lai in 1968, the other from wound, the Wounded Knee Army Massacre of the Lakotas in 1890. Had they not been captioned, it would have been impossible to tell the difference in time and place and who the victims were. During the first US military invasion of Iraq, a gesture intended to obliterate the so-called Vietnam Syndrome. On February 19, 1991, Brigadier General Richard Neal, briefing reporters in uh, Saudi Arabia stated that the U.S. military wanted to ensure a speedy victory once it committed land forces to, quote, Indian country. The following day, in a little publicized statement of protest, the National Congress of American Indians pointed out that 15,000 Native Americans were serving as combat troops in the Persian Gulf. As we've seen in this, I have a whole chapter on, on Indian country, this term Indian country is not merely an insensitive racial slur to indicate the enemy tastelessly employed by accident. Neither Neil nor any other military authority apologized for the statement and it continues to be used by the military and the media, usually in its shortened form in country, which originated in the Vietnam War. Indian country and in country are military terms of trade, like other euphemisms such as collateral damage, kill, that is killing civilians, and ordnance, bombs, that appear in military training manuals that are used regularly. Indian country and in country means behind enemy lines. Its current use should serve to remind us of the origins and development of the U.S. military, as well as the nature of our political and social history. Annihilation until um, up to unconditional surrender. When the redundant ground war, more appropriately tagged a turkey shoot, was launched in the first Gulf War, at the front of the miles of the killing machine, were armored scouting vehicles of the 2nd Armored Cavalry Regiment, the ACR, a self-contained elite unit that won fame during World War II when it headed General Patton's Third Army crossing Europe. In the Gulf War, the 2nd ACR played the role of Chief Scouts for the U.S. 7th Corps. A retired ACR commander proudly told a television interviewer that the second ACR had been formed in the 1830s to fight the Seminole Nation in the Everglades, and that it had its first great victory when it finally defeated those, uh, the, the Seminoles in 1836. That was the second, there were three Seminole Wars from 1815 to 1852. The second ACR, ACR is the vanguard of the ground assault on Iraq, thus symbolized the con continuity of U.S. war victories and the source of the nation's militarism. The Iraq War was just another Indian war in the U.S. military tradition. After weeks of high-tech bombing in Iraq, followed by a caravan of armored tanks shooting everything that moved, the U.S. Special Forces entered Iraqi officers' headquarters in Kuwait City. There they found carrier pigeons in cages and notes in Arabic strewn over a desk, which they interpreted to mean that the Iraqi commanders were communicating with their troops and even with Baghdad using carrier pigeons. High-tech soldiers have been fighting an army that communicated by carrier pigeons, as Shawnees and Muscogees had done two centuries earlier. Twelve years after the Gulf War, a U.S. military force of 300,000 invaded Iraq again. A little red report from Associated Press correspondent Ellen Nickmeyer illustrates the symbolic power of Indian wars as a source of U.S. military mem memory and practice. 
Once again, we find the armored scouting ACR vehicles and their troops retracing historical bloody footprints as they perform what they call the Seminole Indian War Dance. So this is a quote from the article. Captain Philip Wolford's men leaped into the air and waved empty rifles in an impromptu desert war, a war dance. With thousands of apron tanks, Bradley fighting vehicles, Humvees, and trucks, the mechanized infantry unit known as the Iron Fist would be the only U.S. armored division in the fight and would likely meet any Iraqi defenses head on. We will be entering Iraq as an army of liberation, not domination, said Captain Wolford of Marysville, Ohio. After a brief prayer, Wolford leaped into an impromptu Seminole Indian War dance. Camouflaged soldiers joined him, jumping up and down in the sand, chanting and brandishing rifles. So history is not past. This history, our history, the history of, um, of uh, indigenous peoples in the United States is an ongoing history of the United States. In 2007, in April 2007, all the news seemed to be coming for, from Virginia and was about murder. The murder of indigenous farmers that commenced 400 years before the founding of Jamestown and the rampage at nearby Virginia Tech University on April 16, 2007. Yet no one commented in the media of the juxtaposition of those, these bookends of colonialism. Jamestown was famously the first permanent settlement that gave birth to the Commonwealth of Virginia, the colonial epicenter of what became the United States of America nearly two centuries later. <clears throat> the colony, out of which was carved the U.S. Capitol, Washington, D.C., on the river whose mouth lay up the coast. A few years after Jamestown was established, the more familiar and revered colony of Plymouth, Plymouth was planted by English religious dissenters under the auspices of private investors and royal approval, as with Jamestown. And the same mercenary activities personified by Captain John Smith this was the beginning of British overseas colonialism after the conquest and colonization of Scotland, Wales, and Ireland turned England into Great Britain. The Virginia Tech killings were described in 2007 as the worst mass killing, the worst massacre in U.S. history. Descendants of massacred indigenous ancestors took exception to that designation. It was curious, with the media circus surrounding the Jamestown celebration and with Queen Elizabeth and President Bush presiding, that journalists failed to compare the colonial massacres of Powhatans four centuries earlier and the single disturbed individual shootings of his classmates. The shooter himself was a child of colonial war, of the U.S. war in Korea. Mediating on the five major U.S. wars since World War II in Korea, Vietnam, Iraq 1991, Afghanistan, and Iraq 2003, and Iraq 2015. With flashes of historical memory of Jamestown, the Ohio Valley, and Wounded Knee brings us to the essence of U.S. history. A red thread of blood connects the first white settlement in North America with today, and the future, unless we stop it. As military historian John Grenier puts it, U.S. people are taught that military culture does not approve or encourage targeting and killing civilians, and know little or nothing about the nearly three centuries of warfare before and after the founding of the United States that reduced the indigenous peoples of the continent to a few reservations by burning their towns and fields and killing civilians, driving the refugees out step by step across the continent. Violence directed systematically against non-combatants through irregular means from the start has been the central part 
of the U.S.-American way of war. So, under the crust of that portion of the earth called the United States of America, from California to the Gulf Stream waters, to quote Woody Guthrie, are interred the bones, villages, fields, and sacred objects of Native Americans. It should not have happened that the great civilizations of the Western Hemisphere, the very evidence of the Western Hero, hemisphere was appropriated, wantonly destroyed, and the gradual process, progress of humanity that was taking place interrupted and set upon a path of greed and destruction. Choices were made that forged that path toward destruction of life itself, the moment in which we now live and die as our planet shrivels, overheated. To learn and know this history is both a necessity and a responsibility to the ancestors and the descendants of all parties. Thank you. If anyone needs a microphone to uh, come up and uh, ask a question, if you can't be heard, you're welcome. So we do have some time for questions and answers, and I think what I'll do is stand out in the audience, and if there's something, I'll repeat back okay. the questions Great. as loudly as I can. Um, so please, if you have a question, please just raise your hand, and I'll come over and um, stand next to you. If you have a question for Dr. Roxanne Dunbar-Ortiz, that was a wonderful presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'll take this um, out, and you can also come up here if you want. You don't have to stand behind the podium. I think your work is uh, wonderful, very well documented, very needed. Um, and this, your last words about this trail of, of blood that has been sustaining a part of American history. I wonder if you have thoughts about the other side of this, um, like ge the general history of contribution of Indian cultures to the development of the United States or world culture as a whole, how, how this has evolved and how this has uh, gone beyond the borders of each uh, group or even the United States. I, I know you went to Nicaragua. My husband's are you there, so I, I am thinking of that. Well, you know, the colonizing ventures are the basis of the whole French Enlightenment of uh, finding peoples in the Americas, the Pacific, uh, Africa, who had very different civilizations, but while those kind of romantic uh, Rousseauian ideas were being spun, those people were all being uh, victims of uh, genocidal uh, policies and invasions. Um, I'm not much for one that, you know, when um, multiculturalism took off in the wake of the civil rights movement, um, you try, it, the whole point was to fit in what made the United States so great. And I think that's a false assumption. The United States isn't so great. And um, to say that you're proud you contributed to what it is today, I think is not a compliment. <laughs> So, what happened is the appropriation of Native cultures, and that is in everything from the food that feeds the world, the greatest agriculturalists in human history uh, were here in the Western Hemisphere, three of the seven sites of the rise of, uh, of agricultural civilizations. So the appropriations and, and disbursement of food that is very nourishing, that makes people healthier around the world. The potato obviously has saved a lot of, uh, of lives during near starvation. Um, another is, of course, the, the first people, uh, the area where the first set, or the early settlers were in Nova Scotia and um, 
and New England. Uh, this was the land of the, of the Haudenosaunee, uh, the five nations of the Iroquois uh, Confederation, and later uh, the Tuscarora up from North Carolina and joined the Confederation as they were being pressured. And their great system of a, a constitution and democracy and of, um, of um, a federation of six nations, people speaking different languages, having different cultures, uh, different clans that came together who had fought with each other um, before they came together in a confederation of peace. So famously, Benjamin Franklin, who was a Quaker, and the Quakers had been um, uh, allowed by the, uh, the colonial uh, masters, the British, uh, to go to the Seneca um, and missionize the Seneca. And um, he brought back with him these ideas of um, democracy, constitution, but especially the idea of federation, of a confederation, of federalism that could unite the very different 13 colonies because uh, some of these colonies, German was the primary language you know, like Pennsylvania and um, French, you know, in, in, in the north. So um, how, and different religions and Catholic and different Protestant religions, how to um, confederate so it did create a, a new system of government that was copied with some important things left out, and that was the uh, Haudenosaunee were matriarchal. And I try to emphasize that matriarchal doesn't mean the opposite of patriarchal, you know, the pyramid. Matriarchy means democracy, because that's how things should be. Um, <laughs> from the feminist point of view. Women, uh, you know, in the basic uh, decision-making positions and um, telling the men what they need to do. And this certainly was not brought into the U.S. system and still has not been. And also just the hierarchy of monarchies that uh, the United States fit in, they did successfully bring together a federation, and they fought the Civil War to keep that federation together. But they were also building a very uh, a plutocracy, an autocratic regime that most power still rested in the executive. Uh, the executive's also commander-in-chief, so the military was centered, whereas the military and the uh, Haudenosaunee was always under the orders of the clan mothers, you know, whether or not they could uh, make war and never against one another. Uh, so it shows how at least appropriation of parts of things is indeed what gave the United States a, a stability and also more than anything appropriating uh, the roads, the roadways, the, the forests, the crops, the Every inch of North America was uh, manicured and managed, and the game management. So instead of managing game like the Native people had, it's just all out a slaughter of game. Within uh, six years, 30 million buffalo were killed on the plains. But that was also a food fight to destroy the food supply of the plains peoples. So there is that, but I, th I think we should not st start with the premise that the United States is great because it borrowed from, you know, from African Americans, jazz, it's, that's outside, I mean, that's, those are survival mechanisms that is underneath, you know, the subterranean part of our society that can um, be a part of a, a really glorious future without uh, the United States as it is now. Thank you so much for being here and for your leadership and scholarship and sharing the truth um, through your book. And I had a, uh, a question about, and this is related to what uh, you were just saying about how history is not the past. 
Um, what do you believe are the strategies um, that we can do and act upon to change the path that history is on? Well, in my talk, I tried to lay out, you know, the great, last great resurgence. It's very hard, you know, those, all, all, all those movements I was tracing, they've been, there was a, a COINTELPRO, the FBI, suppressing, arresting leaders, uh, practically destroying the American Indian movement. But out of that, out of the 60s, organizations, only the American Indian movement has survived. And it has really survived in the form of the International Indian Treaty Council that then went to the international level. So there are lots of things in place for uh, a much smarter resurgence than those of us back then that didn't know anything about what we were doing. We had very incomplete understanding of the United States itself, I think, um, its history and um, how, uh, let's see, um, unlikely it was to get self-determination within the colonial system that exists with the doctrine and discovery solidly in place. So I cannot recall us back uh, 30, 40 years ago in our activism that we ever brought up the doctrine of discovery. And yet it's right there before us. And not until this decision a few years ago um, that had to do with Oneida, I can't remember the name of the case, but just a few years ago, in which they invoked again the doctrine of discovery by invoking, invoking the Cherokee cases in denying Oneida. And that kind of, uh, you know, started this. The, the doctrine of discovery is, uh, there's a whole chapter in the book on it. Uh, there are many other things to read on it. Robert Miller uh, has really good stuff. Um, it was uh, a, a papal bull of 1454 that gave the Portuguese monarchy um, the mandate, the right, to invade and occupy West Africa and take human beings as slaves. This was the beginning of the transatlantic slave trade and the chattel, chattel slavery uh, using Africa as a, uh, as a literally stealing human beings uh, before you know, 18th and 19th centuries that were colonialism there. So this was, um, this is the heart of the law that actually controls, is the colonial control of Native people in the United States today. Uh, it was pronounced by Thomas Jefferson um, in 1803 as the continuation of international law of Great Britain had used to uh, colonize North America that the United States had inherited so much for the United States making a clean break right from empire. It immediately embraces the doctrine of discovery uh, in order to take the lands in the Old Northwest, the Ohio Valley, and in the Southeast, outside the 13 colonies. And they immediately set about doing that. Of course, the wars with the Shawnee and the Creeks and leading up to re removal. But in the 1820s, there were a series of cases around the Cherokee and Georgia. And that's when Chief Justice John Marshall inscribed into the U.S. Constitution and U.S. law uh, the U.S. Doc the Doctrine of Discovery applying uh, to the United States. And that says that uh, the discoverer, the Christian uh, regime's discoverer, uh, has the right to all the land discovered um, and that the people who are already there have no rights whatsoever. They can maybe stay there if a sovereign, you know, the U.S. government, monarchy um, allows them to, but they have no inherent rights. So the reservation system that's set up, there's no inherent rights. Our treaty, and that's why the treaties are so important, because the treaties do trump the doctrine of discovery, but not all Native nations have treaties, and not all treaties are 
really for self-determination. So there are some treaties, like the 1868 um, Sioux Treaty, the 1850s treaties here in the Northwest that are extremely important. But we have to, we've gotten the, um, almost all of the Protestant, liberal Protestant churches, the, the Quakers, the Unitarians, the Lutherans, the, the Methodists, the Presbyterians, they have all denounced the doctrine of discovery. But of course the Vatican, the source. But I, when I tell people about this, that the US controls Native Americans in the 21st century under a papal bull of the Middle Ages, they're really shocked and think that that's absurd. You know, so I think it's really important to um, teach people to include that in courses in public uh, uh, debate. Also, the uh, Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples uh, that the, we got through the United Nations after 30 years of work uh, in 2007. It really is practically the same document we took um, in 1977 to the UN, that 20-point program that um, was, you know, the Trail of Broken Treaties. And we had then to negotiate for 30 years, but pretty well stood fast. We didn't get every single thing we wanted, but we got the language of self-determination. We got the language of, of religious rights, of um, inherent human rights, of rights to the land and territories, uh, traditional, not just the ones that are recognized by the government. So this is a very, um, useful teaching tool, but it's also a, um, uh, a pre-international law form. A declaration isn't a treaty, but you think about it, the Declaration on Human Rights wasn't a treaty either, and yet there's a whole body of law. It's, it's accepted as international common law. Uh, so I think we want to get the Indigenous Peoples uh, Declaration accepted as common law. One way to do that is like right here, the University of Washington try to get the student body or graduate student body or the undergraduate or both um, to um, endorse the doctrine of discovery. That's a real, I mean, not the doctrine. <laughs> to denounce it <laughs> and to uh, endorse the um, declaration. And we're doing that, you know, with city councils, with states, legislatures, with uh, schools, any institution, any church. And this is an educational device. It's a very important tool. So negating the doctrine of discovery and affirming the declaration, I think, is... Um, and, well, the larger question of how things will change, we have to win over the entire except for the 1% uh, U.S. public to change the society. And I think only indigenous people's ideas, credibility as indigenous peoples, and righteousness, forms of government, I think is only with indigenous leadership and being out there. Um, and I think that's, that's how things will change, is simply by indigenizing everyone in this country, in the world. I keep getting close to that. <laughs> it's okay. All right. Uh, yes, so actually we have to end with questions um, on the stage, but... Um, Dr. Dunbar Ortiz will be sitting um, on this table here. Uh, so she'll be fielding questions throughout till about around 10.40 a.m., is that right? During the break. And during the break. Signing. And signing books. So we also wanted to say that we also have um, Roxanne's books for sale, and she will be signing and taking questions. Um, and also, we would like to thank you so much for thank you so much. our keynote and uh, we have um, a special art piece that was commissioned specifically for this symposium. And uh, this is by Rudy Romero, who, um, who specializes in Coast Salish art and is a local artist here in Seattle. And um, as you can see in this image, 
Uh, there's a salmon, which represents Coast Salish connections, relationships to the land here, and then the raven to represent knowledge. Um, and so uh, we just want to give this to Dr. Dunbar Ortiz and say thank you so much for your stories. Thank you.